Yeah, it was pretty quick from zero to 60, and maybe like a second. Wow. Turns out there's some family history of that, as I've now come to know more about my susceptibility to alcohol. So, Nate, can you tell us a little about about your background and how you came to the moment of joining Beyond 90, uh, Project 90? Sure. Um, well, currently, I'm a healthcare consultant, uh, a partner in a healthcare firm. Um, but kind of moving back in history, I started drinking in college. So I, I did not drink before I went to college, discovered alcohol early on in college, and then just kind of went haywire with uh, using alcohol during college. Um, that then stayed with me, you know, through grad school, um, you know, which kind of takes me to, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, still you know, maybe during the week cut out drinking, but, but at parties that we would either host or parties that I would go to, you know, getting drunk was the norm. There wasn't any, um, you know, just having one or two glasses of wine or, 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 you know, cocktails or whatever continued through into, uh, adulthood marriage with kids, but really Victoria over the last, um, you know, three to four years, uh, the uh, dangerous habit of getting, um, frankly, drunk during the week started creeping in more and more. Um, drinking alone, uh, hiding my drinking or trying to, we can really never hide our alcohol from our family, as we all discover sooner or later from my family. Um, and then you know, the last six months or, you know, the months leading up to the decision to join AFL and P90 um, just uh, got out of control and was, uh, you know, leading me versus me leading it or controlling alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, uh, so then we arrive at the decision, if I may, to join P90 kind of the, the, the episode there, or would you like to? Mm -hmm. I'd like to just uh, dive into that. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you didn't drink at all in high school. You started in college and you really liked it. Yeah, it was uh, pretty quick from uh, zero to 60, you know, maybe mm -hmm. like a second. Wow. Um, wow. And uh you know, it turns out there's some kind of family history of that, as I've you know now come to know mm -hmm. more about. Uh, uh, I guess I'll say my susceptibility to alcohol, mm -hmm. but yeah, it did not take long for me to enjoy alcohol uh, immensely, and mm -hmm. uh, it just you know stayed with me really kind of ever since. Ever since, yeah, I I, I highlight that because. I think it's important for people to understand that this can look different for different people. Uh, you've heard my story, Nate, that I was, I drank in college, had very few consequences, just some hangovers and, you know, silly experiences. Uh, got married out of college, had my children, barely drank. It snuck, I thought, because I also have a family history, I thought I had dodged that bullet. And when it came back into my life, after the passing of my mother, I was having panic attacks and such, uh, it was very, very slow. It was a very slow descent. And that caused cognitive dissonance because it didn't look like what I thought problem drinkers looked like. I thought, wait, 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 wait. Uh, so for our listeners, it's, it's, uh, I think this is an invitation to release preconceptions about what a problem drinker looks like. We can look very, very different. Our experiences may be very different, but the feelings are the same. And then <clears throat> when you grew up and had a family, you did what so many of us do, which is put some boundaries around your drinking. Oh, this is a little too much. I'm a husband. I'm a father. 
I'll just do it on weekends. Except I feel like when people do that, and I did it too, I, you know, manage, budget my days, budget my drinks, what would happen? Tell me if this happened for you. It sounds like it did. Uh, <clears throat> I would squeeze all of my drinking into those drinking approved days. Is that what it was like for you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then slowly, because alcohol is, can be relentless. The weekends weren't enough. You weren't, you weren't able to, to scratch the itch enough on the weekends. And that's when things started getting really sticky and sneaky. Yeah. Um, for the longest time, you know, any party that we would throw, speaking of, you know, kind of compartmentalizing it to weekends or parties or parties that we would go to just included a lot of drinking, um, which, you know, as you kind of mentioned, was normal behavior and, and it still is normal and accepted behavior everywhere. Um, but uh, again, a couple of years ago, it started creeping in where I was, I found myself filling what I thought was a void or sometimes that can be described as boredom mm -hmm. or just like a mental escape. And my, my solution was alcohol because I thought, well, you know, I feel great at these parties. I have such a great time that can probably, you know, give me a better experience doing anything, watching a ball game, uh, whether it be on TV or frankly, one of my kids sporting events. Mm -hmm. And so it just, and then it just lives in your life rent free and in your head rent free and becomes a solution, what right? Or so you think that's a solution. And well, there I was, I was kind of trapped. Very, very well put. Uh, yes, as, as parents <clears throat> and workers, Life can, as much as we love our families and we may really enjoy our work, there's a tedium to it. It can become tedious. And so when we have so much fun on the weekends, spot on. It makes sense to say, well, gosh, I love going to my, to my kids' games but, or to the ball games, but why not just have a, a few drinks and elevate this experience? And alcohol loves when we do that. Like, heck yeah, I'll make everything better. Don't you worry. How yeah. Can... And then one of the, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you. And then one mm -hmm. of the challenges in, is when you try to stop that and then you go to said event, you feel like you're missing something. Mm -hmm. So it is, it itself is its own kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you're just kind of off to the races and, mm -hmm. um, before you know it. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and as you've learned now, uh, through the neuroscience that we teach around in Project 90, you understand now how that happened because alcohol gives us such a hit of dopamine and serotonin and GABA that it does elevate an experience for the first 30 minutes or so. And then, then comes some some consequences, but it makes sense that then if you go to a game or something like that without it, your brain has stopped creating a normal amount of dopamine because it's been, become accustomed to the drug. And so ball games feel boring. And you look around you and you see the alcohol and you're like, wow, I know how to make this better. Ah, I said I wouldn't drink. Ah. And that is, yeah. that is exhausting. Yep. And then the, then you spend all your time thinking about how much you don't want to drink or how much you do want to drink. And you find yourself, or at least I found myself spending a huge amount of mental, mental energy on the drink or not drink. Did I drink too much? And it's unsustainable, or at least it, it got that way for me. It's so much. And, and, and again, for our listeners, Nate and I had some different paths 
But ultimately, we ended up feeling exactly the same way. And so I'm, I'm going to take a guess that many of our listeners are nodding their head right now saying, me too, that's, that's what it's like. And we can't even imagine the, the freedom that comes when that negotiating and bargaining and rationalizing is no longer, no longer an issue. 